If you're a parent, godparent, aunt, or uncle, you've likely shared proud pics of your little one on social media. After all, social media posts not only let faraway friends and family share in the joys and struggles of a parenthood journey, but enable them to literally watch your kids grow up, sending emoji love on every carefully cataloged, cute, funny, and awkward moment from pregnancy to adolescence. But could the act of being observed shape kids' personalities in a negative way or hurt your connection with your kid? Are the privacy and safety concerns significant enough to warrant big change or is this just something we should be aware of? My next guest is an author and psychotherapist whose private practice and daily life frequently put her at the intersection of technology and psychology. She's also an American mom living in the UK who wants nothing more than to display her own pride of her child and stay in touch with stateside relatives. Now, before you're tempted to prematurely conclude anything here, I want you to know this is a no shame episode, but instead a guide in critical thinking around the subject of digital sharing. So today we're gonna do what we do best here, explore with curiosity a social concept unquestioned thanks to cultural hypnosis is posting pics of kids online a bad idea cyber psychologist professor digital sherpa dr elaine casket welcome back digital sherpa i love that thank you i'm happy to be back you can add that to your name tag your you know your next book title whatever whatever feels right Thank you for that permission. I might just do that. (laughs) Well, this subject is so top of mind for you that you wrote another book called Reboot, Reclaiming Your Life in a Tech-Obsessed World. What's been your personal journey with sharing and then not sharing pics of your kids online? Well, uh, my daughter was born in 2010, and coincidentally, in that same year, A certain someone was on stage at the Crunchies, which are the Tech Crunch kind of like awards. uh, And he was saying that privacy was no longer a social norm. And that, of course, was Mark Zuckerberg (laughs) and uh, CEO of Meta, uh, then Facebook. And I, at that point, was a new mom. Um, and I was a new mom who, as you said, was thousands of miles away from home, never having experienced this before, so far away from wise elders and supportive friends. So it's not exaggerating, really, to say that social media was probably a lifeline for me, supportively, at that moment. And then additionally, it became this space where it was really easy and convenient and compelling to share not just photographs, images of my daughter's physical development, but also the development of her personality. And the way that I chose to do that were through these cute little dialogues that I very faithfully transcribed and put up there and got quite a lot of positive reinforcement for over the years. And it was only when I was researching and writing a book about what happens to our data when we die, which you and I have talked about before, that I started thinking, gosh, where do these digital selves start? How early do they start? And who starts them? Because my kid didn't start her own digital footprint, her own digital identity. I curated that for her. I curated that quite powerfully. And I think in so doing, had an even more powerful influence on the development of our personality and psychology. I mean, you could argue there's always been the case, right? Parents are always influential. Parents always talk about their kids. Parents always have expectations of their children, et cetera. But I would argue that the age of social media and sharing online really hypercharges that power. And I became quite aware of the extent of my power And it all kind of came to a head in a pub at a lunch. I asked my then either nine or 10-year-old daughter to come to lunch to ask her opinion about this stuff with the idea for a reboot germinating in my mind. At that point, it was just going to be very much a thing focused on sharing kids' data. It now expanded to the whole lifespan, actually. But at that point, it was focused on this. And I asked her her opinions. And it was a pretty eye-opening conversation um, that kind of changed everything for me. So yeah, 
it kind of changed everything. I was, I never after that day posted a single image of her online ever again. And that was about four or five years ago. Can you share what she said? Well, I mean, I opened it up, the conversation. I hadn't told her that, hey, I'm taking you to lunch because I'm going to pick your brains about this. She didn't realize she was taking a <laughs> meeting, basically. Um, and so, so we just went to lunch. And I said, hey, you know, parents use this kind of forced casualness when they're hoping their kids are going to open up to them. I'm like, so oh, that's true. Um, I was wondering, I'm doing a project. I was wondering if you'd help me out with it. And she, you know, I was wondering if we could have a conversation and if I could record it. And she immediately said, you aren't posting it, are you? And that was her reflexive reaction to that. Sometimes I would just get that reaction when I was just taking my phone out of my bag. And of course, that was the reason I wanted to talk to her in the first place. And I said, no, I'm not posting it. I'm actually interested in thinking about this. And I explained to her about an article that I'd read, which was about an Austrian teenager who had sued her parents for photos taken and, and posted of her throughout her life. And she said that she'd completely lost her right to a private life. So she'd taken her parents to court. There'd been other court cases like this in other countries. I didn't tell my kid that, but I said, oh, there was this article and a teenager was talking about how she felt about it, et cetera. And I was wondering what your opinions were. And she immediately went in and said, I didn't like it when you were posting the funny conversations on Facebook. And I was at first kind of floored by that because she had seemed to appreciate them. I'd printed them up in a book and she was really interested in them. And I thought, this is so great. This is so much better than a baby book. I mean, surely this is for her as much as it is for us or for the parents and friends far away. But she said that she didn't like it. She she had a memory stretching back to before she should have even been able to remember stuff, certain incidents where she had felt betrayed, where she had realized that I had posted something that I wouldn't that I'd said I wouldn't post, where she'd actually asked me not to take a photo and post it, and I did anyway. All the times that she'd felt exposed, all the times that she'd crucially met people that to her were strangers but who seemed to know or to think they knew all these things about her that came into the interaction with all this familiarity and existing expectations and if how she responded or how she replied wasn't the funny, hilarious, dry, David Bowie loving, little muso sort of personality that they were expecting from how I'd curated her, they kind of let her know that she wasn't meeting their expectations, not in a mean way, just in sort of like, oh, but aren't you more of a Bowie girl? Like talking about almost like her character oh. and, her, and her rather than her preferences. Mm -hmm. And she would say things like, you know, crucially, she phrased it just like this. Why am I famous? Why do they think they know me? And so kids who are the subjects of lots of sharenting, parental sharing of or care sharing of young people's information – have a celebrity's understanding of what a parasocial relationship is. So like one way, like people know you, but you don't know them. They have expectations of you and they think they understand stuff and they refer to stuff that maybe you don't want referred to, or it feels crazy for them to know about this stuff. And they've got no power. And she felt like she had no power. And in this recorded conversation, when I asked her, why she hadn't said something explicitly earlier, she shrugged her shoulders and she told me that she didn't think I would stop. Wow. That's major. So once you made the decision to no longer share, how did you navigate the pushback from faraway friends and family who had grown accustomed to seeing updates about her? I got a lot of messages. Um, sometimes on, I don't, I didn't get them on the timeline because I have to approve posts on the timeline before they come onto the timeline on Facebook. And so, uh, but direct messages, querying and wanting to make sure everything was all right, really. And, and, and saying, oh, we miss seeing this or we miss seeing what's going on. Those came from um, looser acquaintances and further flung friends primarily because I had decided upon ways, different ways of sharing information with close inner circle people for whom really it was mostly intended originally, originally 
I think eventually it became about more because I was getting a lot of validation and a lot of positive feedback from other moms, almost like I was doing a good mom thing to be doing what I was doing. Um, so, but I decided that I, and I would explain to those people who inquired where the dialogues had gone that, um, I'd stopped doing it and I explained why. And I wrote a, a, like a blog post on medium, I think. And I posted that and that kind of explained it. Um, and interestingly, then I got some responses from people who felt judged for their own practices, Mm. which I was really concerned about. And a lot of arguments about why it was okay or why it wasn't so bad. And I hadn't put a post up to say, don't do this. I had put a post up or a link to a blog up explaining why I made the decision I did. And that's kind of what I wanted to hopefully, um, I don't know if I can and avoid causing another person to feel a feeling. We know, really, you can't. But I, I, I don't want people listening to this, watching this, to feel shame out the gate, like, or resistance out of the gate, like, well, that's what I do. I did an f- informal poll of listeners and personal friends that said, if you have decided to share pics of your kid, why did you decide that? If not, why did you decide not? And I got lots and lots of responses. Only two people, I believe, said that they chose not to. And they were so gracious in the way that they worded that because it was on a public you know, thread. Maybe even if it wasn't, they still would have been really gracious, but it was definitely a personal decision. And so my goal with exploring this is the goal for nearly every episode that we do here is, like I said in the introduction, to explore aspects of our society that go unchecked because we've been hypnotized to think that they are completely normal. Um, But the truth is really no part of our own actions and our society's actions are, you know, free from the potential of scrutiny. I think that's a healthy thing. So for everyone listening and watching, we're just doing a healthy thing. (laughs) We're exploring this, right? Um, Because it is a bell that is harder to unring. So with that in mind, even though I know we're just kicking off our, our chat, can you tell people, if you're comfortable, different options of sharing, sharing alternatives? Because I feel like a listener may get stuck in the yeah buts. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but how will I share with my grandma? Yeah, but how will I, um, you know, interact with this community if I don't share X or Y? Um, You know, yeah, but I'm so proud of my kid. I love sharing about her. And I love that people also think that she's really awesome too. What are the other options to more securely share information about your family in a way that is maybe more data safe and still gives the kid agency? Well, before we get there about how you can more safely share, I feel like I want to share what I noticed when I ceased doing it about myself because I it led me down a path of reflecting on every time I had the urge or the itch to share something, what that was really about for me, what I was needing in that moment or what I was craving in that moment. Was it validation? Was it connection? Was it more about me? What was it for? Who was it for? What was it about? And I realized that this sort of simple urge to share was really complicated you know, and had mostly to do with me. It really wasn't about most of the time the the maintenance of a relationship or a sense of connection between my daughter and her grandparents, for example, or my daughter and her aunts and uncles or what have you. That wasn't actually the main method by which that was happening anyway. That was already happening via other means, whether it was the occasional visits or whether it was the long holidays or the WhatsApp exchanges or the uh, um, video calling or Skyping that we did and the Zooming that we do now. Uh, Those were the mechanisms by which that was happening. And so my story that I had or my narrative that I had about 
how it was important to share and why it was important to share, I started realizing that those moments that I really wanted to share something that I was scratching some sort of itch that often didn't really have anything to do with my daughter at all. And, and oftentimes were explicitly going against her interests such that she felt disempowered and sometimes even gaslighted when I told her that I wasn't really sharing or she felt manipulated or pressurized when I was begging her and pleading with her to just have this one thing because it was a special occasion. It was a holiday. It was nice and all that kind of stuff like that. And and I started thinking, wow, like, so her entire not to nine years, I've given her the message that she doesn't have power to decide her own boundaries, that I that somebody else is in charge of that. And is that the lesson? <laughs> so it's just like when I was really most of the time responding to me being lonely or me desiring connection or me desiring something like that. And so sometimes it didn't end up being about sharing the picture at all. It was never going to be a solution to the problem that I was experiencing or the urge that I was experiencing. But I don't think I ever would have figured that out really if I hadn't stopped doing what I was doing. But I mean, so the first question is, okay, what what is the sharing about? To what is it, in, what's it in service of? To what end is it? And what is that for me? Um, I think a lot of people feel like because their kids are such a big part of their lives, understandably, obviously, that they feel like when they're sharing about their kids, they're just sharing about their lives. So if they can't share about their kids, they can't share about themselves. And I think that different cultures, because you mentioned our society, but obviously, I don't know how wide or how international your readership is, but there are lots of different kinds of societies that um, see kids and parents kind of decision making and rights or whatever differently, either philosophically or legally or whatever else, you know, and I think the United States both legally and societally, like culturally, is one of these things where it's like my family. Like my family, my decision, you know, I make decisions that are right for my family as a parent. There's, there's, I think that mentality is really familiar in the United States. So maybe there isn't always so much of this kind of dividing line between, you know, my kids versus like me. Um, but I mean, there are all sorts, we're talking primarily about publication. I mean, social media for years, they've been able to get away without, um, that much regulation because they're saying, oh, we're not, we're not a publisher. We're not like a newspaper. We're not, we're not a publisher. We're just like a forum where people can like put their own content or whatever. But essentially we're publishing stuff. We're publishing stuff in this kind of open market on social media where there are of course innumerable more private, more you know channels that you can choose to share pictures with, whether it's you're sharing your, uh, you know, kind of iCloud or kind of like, you know, photo album with select others who have access to that album, you know, within the family or friend circle, or whether it's on WhatsApp threads or whatever it is, you know, there are lots of options for that. So it's not rocket science. So when the compulsion is to do it on social media in a more published way, rather than those back channels, I feel like you've got to stop and think, what's what what what's going on for me here? What is this really, what is this really about? I mean, I want to emphasize to you, I mean, I, I lied to her. She was no fool. Like as you, and, and those transcripts that I had, those dialogues that I did, that I have in a book, I can now flip through that paper book and I can read her saying, what are you doing? Are you writing this down? Are you putting this on everybody's iPhones? Hmm. And I would tell her I wasn't. And I recorded that on, in the dialogues. Like it was funny. Like, isn't this sweet that she's caught me out? But I'm some, I was like, wow, what was I doing there? And so I wasn't just sending that to my family on WhatsApp. I was publishing it in this writerly, curatorial, super powerful way. And that was totally about me. Mm, wow. You know, that's such a heavy I revelation. Re I regret it a lot. I regret it a lot. I still feel like, in many ways, I'm sort of almost like making up for or we're kind of, I feel like the, the relationship is still in some kind of phase of active repair from those years, because in terms of trust or in terms of boundaries or in terms of mutual respect, there's still stuff that she brings up kind of in an affectionate kind of like needling way, but sometimes in a more ang angry kind of way. Hmm. 
as she becomes more digitally aware and navigates her own digital life as an early adolescent. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about Facebook and Instagram because in your book, you say that they begin to curate profiles for people as soon as they detect something is a person. Can you explain yeah, that? A new human being. Yeah. And so um, one of the um, really interesting interviews that I did for my book, because I also started the lifespan of the book at digital gestation, not with infancy, because our online selves, sharenting begins before birth often. A huge percentage of people share the sonogram image. A lot of that. And so, for example, Facebook or Instagram will look at an image like that and think, oh, is there text here that can be pulled out? You know, what's the metadata that can be pulled out of this? It starts building up a profile of this separate person, which is easily recognizable through facial recognition or whatever it is. Now, in the law of the land where you are, it might say, oh, this is not allowed to be associated with a person. But as soon as that person then comes of age, whatever the legal age, it can be re-identified with that person because there's a continuity, right? And so, so it, it pulls, so, and it encourages us. Facebook has this like scrapbook feature where it would incentivize you to be like, oh, well, a kid's not supposed to have a Facebook uh, profile, but you can organize all of your material associated with this child into the scrapbook. That's convenient. <laughs> Maybe it's convenient for the parent, although I'm not quite sure how, uh, but it's certainly convenient for the company. And so, you know, you've got to understand that, and Shoshana Zuboff talked about this a lot in her book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. This is about the behavioral futures markets. And the behavioral futures markets are the hugely remunerative, hugely lucrative thing of being able to predict and manipulate future consumer behavior based on data and think about the data profile that would have been built up about my kid through my own sharenting practices because they were quite rich you know they i was a, i'm a photographer as well so i mean i just like the stuff that she liked the things that she responded to the things that she wore the way that she evolved it was kind of all there you know that's a big data dream right <laughs> it is a big you know? data dream and so and so it will so kid children's data are really really valuable on the behavioral futures market and hence really valuable to these companies um, they also, there was a piece of, um, Australian research that was on another note, uh, Australian research that was conducted way back, I think as far as 2015 or 2017, because you can only imagine the situation now. Um, and it was discovered that roughly half of the images that were found on, uh, pedophilia image sharing websites, um, were not original images generated by these criminals or by you know kids sharing pictures of themselves or whatever. It was photographs from friends and family social media. Wow, you know, so it's like you know the statistics about how many offenders there are, and something like eighty percent of sexual offenders have no prior criminal record. They don't have a criminal record. Do you know what I mean? So you don't. If you have a friends group of 100, 500, 1,000, we would all love to think that everybody in our network is a nice person, is a safe person, is a legit person, all those kinds of things. The statistics about the number of offenders and the frequency of childhood sexual preoccupation abuse tell a different story. It's highly likely that somewhere in those networks, there are people who have less than salubrious intentions towards images of your kids. Yeah. You know, I don't think about that or talk about that a lot in my book because I'm far more interested in my relationship with my kid and what was communicated and what was conveyed and how our relationship dynamic evolved and hence how her psychology and her personality evolved because of what I shared and well, how I shared it. A lot of people when faced with these potential consequences, you know, they kind of react in a way that's, uh, oh, yeah, man, I believe it. You know, Facebook and Instagram is tracking you. Oh, yeah, man, I don't doubt it. You know, because whenever I personally get interested in a subject for the podcast, I, I like to bring those subjects up in conversation and see how they play out in real life, just in order to make this moment more relevant to a, a real person listening to it, 
you know, and not just um, satisfying my own curiosity itch. And that is what I experienced is most people were like, oh yeah, yeah, totally see that, totally see that. But it's having what appears to be zero impact on their parenting style after the fact. And it seems to create kind of a numbing effect for the consequences themselves. So I wanted to ask you if you could put on your like psychotherapist hat for a minute and talk to me about why is that happening? What is that? It's learned helplessness and learned helplessness is this concept. Uh, They uh, did learned helplessness studies back in the day in laboratories with dogs with golden retrievers, I think, or at least I remember a picture of a golden retriever uh, in a, in a shock cage and the floor would shock in unpredictable ways. At first the dog would make attempts to escape and would fail in doing so. And then after a time, the dog would just lie down on the floor of the shock cage and give up. Basically this was learned helplessness. And then when the researchers would open the door of the cage and offer treats and sort of say, look, here's the way out, whatever. The dog would just be like, hmm, you know, like this. Now, learned helplessness behavior happens in humans too. And I think that learned helplessness is encouraged and inculcated in us by the kind of dialogue and discourse in society. And in a way, I feel like it almost plays into the hands of big data, social media companies for us all to believe there's nothing that we can do and for us to have this big collective shrug because the collective shrug plays into their hands. It ensures that we'll just keep on doing what we're doing because brains are super efficient. And if we hold the belief that there isn't anything that we can do to kind of like fight the machine and there's no other alternative or there's nothing we can do, they've got us where they want us. Well, why expend energy fighting the good fight, you know? And so for years, I knew, of course, because I work in this area all the time about the tracking or the surveillance or surveillance capitalism. And I knew all of this kind of stuff like that. And what my book really focuses on thinking about the psychotherapist hat is the thing that meant the most to me, the thing that uh, like (laughs) encouraged, not just encouraged me, but basically made me sit up and think, all right, Elaine, what are you going to do is the realization that there had been an extremely real impact on the person that I loved most in the world, not directly because of Facebook and Instagram and all that kind of stuff, but my choices, choices that I had control over in full knowledge, a lot of the time that those choices maybe weren't you know, the best thing, but I kind of looked away from it because it was serving my own emotional and psychological needs. And so that's why I kind of root everything that I'm talking about in the book, not in like, oh, here's how you can fight back against like big tech, because that's dumb. That's like tilting it. Well, it's tilting at windmills. You know, there's nothing anybody can do on an individual level to do about this stuff. It's so easy to slope into or sink into learned helplessness. Whereas I'm thinking, well, where is my leverage? Where are the choices? What choices have I made? What difference has that made? How has that had an effect that I can feel, that the people that I love can feel? And what what is my responsibility to myself? What is my responsibility to them? And that's why I wanted to have a really real conversation with my daughter that was actually really hard to hear. You know, when she started talking about this, I could have gone like, okay, whatever, you know, I don't want to hear anymore. Like, I don't want to hear this. And I think that in a lot of ways we do that, you know? Our children engage in protest behaviors. Protest behaviors might not be like, I'm going to sit down and give you a really articulate rundown of what bothers me about this. <laughs> like protest behaviors are like, mom, no, 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 don't do that. And like my daughter is sort of saying, are you going to post it? Or like sort of like, you know, other kinds of things that say, I'm not comfortable. I'm not comfortable. And then so many of us are like, oh, but honey, you know, we run roughshod over that. Hmm. When you're seeing protest behaviors like that, And it's about something that's about kids' boundaries or about their power or about their choices or about their agency. I I didn't, I didn't listen. And that's shocking to me because I'm a psychologist. (laughs) That's shocking to me. Yeah. You know, but, but when, but when we're being pulled into it and, and when everybody's doing it, you know what I mean? When we're not sure about what's the right thing to do or whatever, we look around at our environment and it's called social proof. We're like, oh, well, everybody else is doing it. So there's the social proof that this is what you do. And and also it feels good and I'm getting reinforcement for it. So tick, 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 you know, yeah. it must be fine. So then you tell yourself a story. And I, yeah. So, so the only leverage 
that I really had to change my own behavior was super personal. It wasn't intellectual. It wasn't some sort of like, oh, I intellectually understand that, you know, there's my, you know, that, you know, Facebook or Meta or whatever is collecting data on my kid. Like, okay, that bothers me, but it wasn't sufficient to change my behavior. And I would argue that it's not sufficient to change most people's behavior. So it sounds like you have to really be truthful about what the relationship effects are of what you are doing. It sounds like you also, excuse me, took a very um, serious journey into inspecting your own motives. And so I love the questions that you just spit out. I think those are great questions for parents to ask themselves in order to more accurately observe their own behavior. However, I would love to ask you the question, how can we help kids observe their own behavior? Because not all kids, as I'm sure you're aware, are protesting this sort of you know, posting and sharing. Some of them eat it up. Some of them hand their phones to their moms or have their moms take their picture. Oh, will you share that? Did How many people liked it? And it is changing their behavior on the opposite side of the spectrum. And still further to complicate things, there are some kids that for whatever reason are pretty neutral on the matter. And so how can we help both those two examples observe their own behavior and create a sense of agency that's rooted in real life, not just an online emoji collecting machine. Yeah, it's a really good question uh, because you're right. You know, kids have their individual reactions and sensitivities and some skew completely the other direction, you know, very performative, <laughs> you know, can't wait to get themselves out there in the moment that there are, I mean, so many kids in the here in the UK, you know, 95% of kids like use messaging apps, you know, like that what's happened in the UK is supposed to be like 16. So they can hardly wait to get their own hands on it. And I think that by that age, often they've been inculcated into this idea that, um, you know, that sharing about yourself, you know, in the world is what you do. And it's partly because of, you know, parental behavior and parental facilitation. And one of the situations that you described there is a situation where you start looking at that and thinking, oh, like, are they basing their sense of worth on how many likes did that get? And and what kind of conversation or what kind of intervention, if any, do we, I want to do there? Like, wh- where is that, where is that heading? It, you know, in the development in, of their psychology and their personality and their understanding of like, what determines my worth in the, in the world? because that could be an issue of a different type, you know, or kids who are neutral about it. And by all means, if a kid is just like neutral about it and it doesn't, and it doesn't matter to them, like you would, you might say, oh, well then great. You know, I can proceed. Like they're not feeling disempowered. They don't feel like they don't have agency. Um, part of that might be because they're not paying attention. They don't actually know, Yeah, you know, like what's going out about them in the world. They don't really understand. Um, and part of them that might be there's consequences that we don't understand that have yet to mature about our own sharing practices. So there's been a study here in the UK that's estimating that by 2030, something like 7 million or more children will have, once children like now coming into adulthood, will be at huge risk of identity impersonation and financial fraud because of the stuff oh, that wow. their parents shared about them as they were growing up. And if you think about it, with the advances in AI and audio chatbots, video chatbots, or whatever. Amazon's, you know, showed on stage in Las Vegas last June, a thing where it only took less than a minute of an audio of grandma's voice, grandma now deceased, to read the whole of The Wizard of Oz to her grandson on Alexa. So, I mean, like, (laughs) we're still blithely sharing our own information and our kids' information, and you're like, in the hands of the wrong actors, that kid's agency could be completely taken away from them in the form of identity theft, and we're just not thinking in those terms. So even if a kid's neutral about it, and I realize I'm bopping back and forth between talking about the kind of like practical, pragmatic kind of risks, and the risks with respect to, I don't know, just what 
kids come to believe their power and agency and relationship are, how confident they feel at like navigating and negotiating power differentials. Because I don't care how neutral or positive or negative your kid is about these practices. The reality is there's a power differential. You're here and your kid's here. Yeah. So my daughter, even though I asked her, I've got to really give it to her for her feeling like she could give that to me. You know, because it could have been really easy for her to be like, oh, I can't say anything. And when the the worst moment in the world for me in that conversation was when I asked her why she didn't say something more explicit, which is a joke, because did I really prepare the ground for her to be, feel safe to say something explicitly to me? And she said she didn't think I would stop anyway. Yeah. I was like, how eloquent a summing up of how helpless she felt to do anything about anything. So some of those so-called neutral kids who are acting like they don't mind, is it that, that they really don't mind that you're seeing? Is it learned helplessness? Is it ignorance that you as the parent might share about what the consequences of that sharing might be? All of the above? Yeah. Wow. You know, we have about 10 minutes left. And so I got a couple of questions that I want to be sure to, to ask you. So it may feel like rapid fire. So I ask your forgiveness ahead of time. I'll all try of, to give more rapid fire answers. <laughs> all of what you've covered so far, you know, is um, really about the developing the sense of agency within the child, developing a, a positive, healthy relationship between a caregiver and a child. And the possibility that, you know, bad actors could come in and steal identity, could come in and uh, assault, sexually assault a child. You know, um, I think those are all completely valid. And the more extreme ones, I think parents know, because I've talked with a few parents, they're like, oh, yeah, I know about that. But as we all do as people, we don't see those as close like almost like they don't seem that like very likely in other words. Okay. So I want to talk about some other potential impacts of sharing that may seem more may may seem closer to home. And that's through a real example of I have different sets of cousins on different sides of the family who both have a child who developed uh, type 1 diabetes. And the journey of their type 1 diabetes diagnosis is well chronicled on Facebook. Now those accounts, I believe are private. I don't really know. I don't pay that close attention. But I can't help but wonder if even on a private account, if posting such detailed accounts of diagnosis and control of glucose could impact future employment approval for life insurance, or even work against that young person in an automobile accident claim. Am I overboard? No, the answers to those questions are yes, yes, and yes, all that could happen. And that's one of the values of the behavioral futures markets. I mean, it's not just behavioral futures markets, it's just like personally identifiable information and relevant health information futures markets. And in places where uh, there's a huge economy around um, health insurance, like private health insurance, that's a real kind of major part uh, where health insurance can be granted or denied or whatever it is. This is huge. I mean, it's huge. Health insurance companies are a big purchaser of data like this, you mm. know, aggregated data like this, but data that can be re-aggregated. Um, and so even sort of in, in, in physiological monitoring for infants like the outlet sock or other kinds of things that collect oxygen saturation and heart rate data and maybe triangulates it with other things, those can be of value because they might find out through the miracle of big data that, oh, we don't know why, but kids with this reading when they were such and such an age are 50% more likely to develop such and such a kind of, I don't know, cardiac event by the age of 39 when would be a really nice time to cancel their health insurance, maybe around there, you know? So absolutely, yeah. there's all sorts of different ways that that can disadvantage them. Um, and all sorts of data generated, um, th that's medical data, but, you know, there's there's um, behavioral data that's collected in classrooms all across the United States, uh, you know, where there's behavioral data that is, you know, kind of uh, collected and uh, put up on the board. And it's like the digital version of the old traffic light system and all of this academic stuff can go in there. But that behavioral data as interpreted by the teacher is like social scoring. 
And like, and social score, you know, we talk, we clutch our pearls about social scoring in China, for example. Yeah. So I'm like, but wait, <laughs> there's social scoring happening in classrooms all over the United States on a platform, which I won't name here, that hasn't even like passed like privacy checkup tool kind mm. of things and where the data can easily leapfrog into other kinds of platforms as well. So it's like there's all sorts of data that's generated not just by parents, but also by people in the educational environment um, and other settings that can end up disadvantaging young people in all manner of ways that might not be easy to predict now and might differentially disadvantage certain kinds of kids or kids from certain kinds of social, racial, or ethnic backgrounds. Oh, yeah, man, that's so true. Oh, I have so many more questions and so little time. Um, <laughs> Trying to choose. I know. I, I really am. Do you see the process of my mind going, okay, which, I seeing the oh, which, which question can I let go of? I think... <laughs> the cogs are turning. They are. They're turning hard. Um, yeah, I can. I think the big question and, and the last question I'll ask, um, of course, before giving you um, a chance to, to plug your new book and what's going on with you is what's the best next step for parents? Because you're talking about real things. I'm sure this is hitting home, uh, not just with parents, but, you know, like I – other people's kids, you know, we're at a party together and we take a little selfie and they're just so cute. And I post it, you know, this is really changing how I view other people's kids agency also. But for a parent parent, you know, I'm, I'm not a parent parent. I'm like a fake parent. <laughs> I'm like the friend of the parent, but for a parent parent, they are wading through some thick rivers of guilt and shame and, um, Decision making, they have decision fatigue. They're also socially pressured to share this information. And their kid, you know, may also uh, pressure them because, you know, the kid, depending on when they were born, may be very accustomed to this sharing. They may have apps that track their friends all the time where they're at. And they are very accustomed to being watched and being observed and tracked and posted and graded online and up thumb up, thumb down. Imagine that person that's swimming in that muck. What do you want to say to them? What's their best next step? Mm. What I would say is, is that I felt like I was swimming through a lot more muck really before I just made a hard and fast decision to uh, stop. Um, I, I actually have a general rule about other people's data in general. Do you know what I mean? And I realized that actually social media lost a lot of interest for me really at the point when I decided that I didn't necessarily want to post about other people, unless it's going to be something that will help my fellow author, or, you know, whatever, like post that people want me to make because it's going to help them out. Um, I, I mean, I guess it's really hard because there's so many potential steps in a way, but the macro step to me, it's not so much about what you do in terms of specific action. It's about a mindset. And that mindset is one where you become, just take a few more beats to sort of think, wait, what's going on for me? Like what's driving this? Because like you say, you called it hypnosis at the top of this, of the episode, right? And it is always possible, I think, to sort of snap yourself out of this kind of hypnosis. If you can just sort of think, wait, like what's going on for me? Like, cause it feels so necessary. It feels so automatic. It feels so, and then you just think, wait, this, at least this happened for me. I'm like, how did I get here? Like, how did, how did we get here? How did I get here? And why am I feeling like this is so important? Like, why am I feeling like this is such a sacrifice not to do? And so I realize it's a really complicated thing in some ways to sort of talk about it in mindset terms, but don't we all have all sorts of things, like all the lists of things we should do and all the things we shouldn't do and the next steps to take and all that kind of stuff. And like we make commitments and we fall off the wagon and we forget, you know, the thing or that we do the other thing enough. Do you know what I mean? It's like everybody bangs on about mindfulness and make mindfulness and everything like that, but all that mindfulness really is is awareness in the present moment without judgment. We don't have enough awareness in the present moment because we're, our high, attention is getting hijacked the whole time. 
And we don't have enough lack of judgment because society is soaking in it. There's like so much judgment. There's judgment of the self. There's judgment of the other. There's fear of judgment. It's all over the shop, right? Mindfulness is awareness in the present moment without judgment. And if you can bring that to moments when you are about to take the picture, share the thing, override your kids' requests, you know, ignore their protest behaviors, you always have that power. That that line is to yourself, between yourself and yourself is always open. You can always be the watcher of your own experience like that and sort of say, why am I feeling like this is so important? You know? And maybe you need something in that moment. Maybe you need love. Maybe you need attention. Maybe you need validation. Maybe you need, I don't know what you need. There are probably three dozen other ways to get that. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think so that's... that's a big answer to your simple question. <laughs> no, it's, it's but it's a uh, effective strategy. So uh, thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Seriously. Tell people where they can find your book and, you know, however else you like to keep in touch with people about what you have going on. Sure. Well, that's the million dollar question. Um, So in the UK, where I am resident, as you said, uh, Reboot is out on the 31st of August of this year of 2023. Um, The wheels are sort of in motion about when and what is going to be available in what form in the US. But from what I understand, the audiobook at the very least will be coming out in autumn 2023 sometime in most territories, including the United States. So even if there's a situation where the hardcover book isn't like on amazon.com just yet, the audiobook is highly likely to precede it, um, even if the actual physical book doesn't come out till 2024. But what I'm going to do, because I have such strong ties to an America, I want to make sure that all of my American family and friends and colleagues do know how they can get hold of it, is that I will keep my website at elainecasket.com continuously updated for where you can get Reboot in audio or digital or paper form. And I will probably have to have a special little click this button thing for the United States uh, because of it might just be on a different calendar to other places. And so elainecasket.com is probably the best place to keep in touch with me and to link to other stuff that I have going on on its various sections. Awesome. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate this. I really appreciate being here. And it's always really nice to talk to you. Hey, you're still here. Thanks for watching. If you love breaking free from the algorithm to explore curiosity, join me each week by hitting subscribe and the bell for new upload notifications.